Climate Group, we're delivering a series of virtual and in-person events this year in partnership with Lloyd Re Register Foundation to highlight the urgent issue of climate resilience. So every year we're seeing an increase in the frequency and intensity of climate events, uh, extreme weather events. Um, we've seen the recent wildfires in Hawaii, they're one of our members. Uh, we've seen drought and also flooding, um, for instance, in Emilia-Romagna uh, earlier this year, they're another one of our members in Italy. So people and ecosystems are suffering. As we continue to work towards net zero, uh, we must also pay attention to the situation on the ground now and build resilience where we can. So today's webinar looks at how these issues affect subnational governments, uh, which Climate Group works with through our position as Secretary of the Under Two Coalition, with the largest group of network of subnational governments aiming to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or earlier. Together, these governments are finding new ways to adapt to a changing world, and we'll hear more about their experiences, their achievements and concerns here today. So I'd now like to invite you to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, please include your name, where you're dialing in from, uh, and what you're hoping to learn from today's webinar. Great, thanks. I can see we have colleagues uh, from Navarra. Um, where else? Uh, Galicia in Spain. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, we've got somebody from um, the Institute of Rural Management in Islamabad, Pakistan, also from the Scottish government. Welcome. Colleagues from the Lloyd's Register Foundation as well. Thanks for joining us. So yeah, we've got a range of people from a lot of places. Thank you. Welcome. Please do keep including um, your name and where you're coming from in the chat. Um, and yeah, we'll continue with the webinar. So yeah, today on the panel, uh, we have a number of guest speakers, really looking forward to introducing you to them. Uh, we have Ed Morrow. Ed is a senior campaigns manager at Lloyd's Register Foundation. He leads the communications for the World Risk Poll, the first global study of risks to people's safety. And we'll hear more about that shortly. Uh, we also have uh, Barna Majumdar. Uh, Barna is an environmental engineer. She's involved in the planning and implementation of strategic policy decisions on air and water pollution at the Environment Department under the government of West Bengal. Next, we have Nick Kordesh. Nick serves as the Energy Program Manager as part of the City of Oakland Sustainability and Resilience Division. His work includes building decarbonization at municipal facilities and increasing energy resilience. And finally, we have George uh, Karagiannis. Um, George is the Director of the Engineering Leadership Program at Resilience Rising. Uh, he leads a peer-to-peer -peer engagement platform with a vision to capture the voice of engineering firms worldwide. His area of expertise revolves around emergency management, critical infrastructure, protection, and hybrid threats. Thank you all for joining us from all these different corners of the world. Really looking forward to hearing from you. So just to kick us off, um, to begin the discussion, I'd like to welcome Ed uh, to go first. Ed is going to welcome us to is going to introduce the World Risk Poll to us. Um, so I'm going to hand over to you, Ed, to share your slides. Great. Thanks very much, Jebby. Just give me one moment to share my screen. Okay. Can we all see that okay in presentation mode? Yes, perfectly well. Thanks. Great, thank you. So as Jebby has mentioned, um, from the Lloyd's Register Foundation, I'm going to introduce our World Risk Poll today and the data that that contains in terms of understanding and improving resilience to climate change. Uh, before I do that, I'm just going to say a little bit quickly about our organisation, Lloyd's Register Foundation, as I expect many in the room won't be familiar with us. And we are an independent global charity who have a mission essentially to engineer a safer world. And we, we fund both research and interventions across a broad range of global safety challenges to that end, which you can see set out on the screen here. I won't go into all of those now, but just to sort of highlight the ones around the safety of fiscal infrastructure, safety for a sustainable future and public understanding of risk as well. And all these themes sort of come together around this issue of climate change resilience, which we're increasingly um, becoming involved in. 
So what is the World Risk Poll? So the World Risk Poll is the, the first global study of risk to people's safety and how people both perceive and experience those things. So really kind of critically has this ability to compare what people believe are the biggest threats to their safety versus what they actually kind of experience sort of day to day in, in real life. And this includes 121 countries around the world, over 125,000 interviews in the last um, wave, which were conduct conducted by our polling partner at Gallup as part of their wider um, world poll. Um, we've conducted this two times so far, first in 2019 and then in 2021. And the, the data that I'm going to talk to you about today comes from that 2021 survey. But we are currently in the field again to repeat these questions I'm going to talk to you about in 2023. Um, and we will be repeating it again in 2025. So we will be able to track that data longitudinally and see how things are changing, improving over time or, or getting worse perhaps in different parts of the world. As part of the most recent poll, we, we had modules on people's perceptions of risk and safety before and during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, on the threats from AI and personal data, violence and harassment at work. But of course, the module I'm going to talk to you about today is the one which relates to disaster resilience. And this is a slightly different one to the other modules in that rather than asking people about what they perceived and experienced as risk to their safety, we asked people about how they felt that they and their communities, their governments, their societies were prepared to deal with threats of disasters, both related to climate change and other threats, um, and, and use that to construct a resilience index, which I'll talk to you about in just a moment. So. How, how we did this in this module is to ask people in all of these countries questions about resilience at an individual level, at a household level, at a community level, and a society level. So at an individual level, we're talking about things including people's sense of agency. How well do they feel able to protect themselves and their family in the event of a climate change related disaster? At the household level, we're talking about things such as financial resilience. So if people, as a result of a, a flooding event or a wildfire, lose their, their means of gaining their income, their, their, their way of kind of the working, how long can they cover their basic needs such as their housing and their food and so on. Also within that area we ask things about household disaster planning for instance, so do people have a plan in place that everybody in the household knows about how they should react in the event of, of a um, natural hazard or a disaster. At community level, we bring in measures of social capital and social support. So we ask people about how much they believe their neighbours care about themselves and their well-being, and also about how likely they are to have helped a stranger um, recently. To bring together this measure of how likely people are to help each other out as first responders in the event of a disaster. And finally, at the society level, we ask things about people's trust in their government institutions and their infrastructure, such as transport and health services and emergency services, to respond to climate related disasters um, but we also asked about things like people's experience of, of discrimination down to a range of different factors and the effect that that can have on, on social cohesion and so um, undermine resilience. Now, the graphic you can see on the right is the resilience index, which we built on the back of all this data. Um, and this is something that you can see on our World Risk Poll website if you go to the address that I'll be sharing at the end of the presentation. And you'll be able to um, look at that to see where your individual countries rank within this resilience index and how well they fare in, in relation to these four different aspects of resilience um, that, we, that we measure. Now, just at a top level, looking at how these resilience scores came out across the world, there is a significant um, variance in resilience in countries we looked at across the world. Um, and there is a correlation with income, as perhaps people would expect. So we can see a number of high income European uh, countries up at the top. But there are countries, for example, Vietnam, that bucks the trend as a lower middle income country, yet still came out top of the rankings in terms of resilience. And um, Vietnam did very well, for instance, on measures related to household disasters planning and to trust in government as well. So this just a sort of goes to show that there are things that even countries with lower incomes can do to improve resilience. And if we look down to a regional level, we see kind of significant variations at all. Now, the regional breakdowns of the data are not available on the website. This is something that we can do as kind of a, a bespoke service really to look into the data sets, especially in countries where we have larger sample size and provide a breakdown of how both the resilience index scores, but also the individual kind of questions that lead into that um, vary across different countries. So just to show India here and to push out 
put pick out West Bengal as we've got a speaker from West Bengal here today and we can see their resilience is roughly in line with the average for India as a whole but you can see on the right of the map there that there are some significant um, variations in resilience by region particularly in the east of the country. And it's also worth bearing in mind that our kind of national and regional level resilience scores only tell us so much. One other thing that we're able to do with the World Risk Poll data is to break this down by various demographic factors. So we can look at, you know, standard breakdowns like gender, uh, like age, whether people are living rurally and urbanly. But we can also break down by um, factors such as income and then we can perform multiple layers of analysis. So for example, if we want to, to look how uh, women in urban areas are faring compared to the rest of the population, um, we can do those breakdowns. And as you can see here, just by, by a few of these breakdowns at a global level, we can see a clear uh, relationship between resilience and income um, and gender and rural and urban settings as well. Just to delve into some of the particular um, sort of question um, results that came out of some of the data that goes into constructing this index. For example, looking at this idea of community support, this is an interesting one where we saw actually our measures of community support came up higher in low income countries than in high income countries. So this is perhaps something that we need to look at and capitalize on and harness in terms of how community support, community first responders can, can be made use of in order to compensate um, for some of the the other weaknesses and other areas of resilience. One thing we also identified throughout the, the poll is a clear relationship with people's access to the internet and how prepared they felt to deal with a disaster, climate related or others. So you can hear, see from the chart on the left that more people who have internet access felt able to protect themselves and their family in the disaster. So it just goes to show how crucial um, that form of infrastructure is in terms of building resilience. And to look at the results from the measure of financial uh, resilience that we put into the poll, we asked people about how long they believed that they could cover their, their basic needs if they were to lo lose all their income in the event of a disaster. And you can see how those responses break down across global regions here. So if we look down to the bottom, we can see over 50% of people in Southern Asia said that they could cover their basic needs for less than a month if they lost their income. And obviously there's a correlation here with the income of the regions in question, but we can sit, sit, still see that even in Northern Western Europe, we have over 10% of people who could cover their needs for less than a month. Um, so, so this kind of financial vulnerability is something that really is a critical factor in undermining resilience. And just to say a little about how some of this data can be a benefit to people in subnational governments here in terms of assessing resilience. Um, one of the real kind of benefits of the approach that we've taken is a really kind of broad, holistic um, approach to assessing resilience, resilience that we've taken, where we don't look just at more kind of hard traditional infrastructure measures, but we also factor in um, these critical soft socioeconomic factors at the individual and community level, which are so important to building um, resilience. Because of the way we can break this data down demographically and by regionally, it allows um, people to understand where vulnerabilities in terms of resilience lie and to tar target interventions on the back of that. Um, and while many national level findings will be applicable at regional level at all, um, the real kind of benefit of people in this room is if we're able to kind of work with you to produce bespoke regional level analysis of this data as well. So very open and happy for people to talk to us about that. And I'd love this to just be the start of a conversation. Um, to mention, we are looking at geotagging the World Risk Bowl data as well to kind of give an even greater level of um, regional accuracy to our, to our findings. Um, and just to say kind of the opportunities that we have going forward, that we have an open funding call for um, organizations to build interventions and research programs built on the World Risk Bowl data to improve resilience. And um, George is going to talk about one of those in a little bit that we've funded already. But um, it's absolutely something that we'd love um, the subnational governments in the room to think about if they could partner on or, or lead a project um, that they could submit for, for that funding program. And finally, we'd also love to hear you about what other kind of questions would be useful to help you understand resilience in your context, which we could potentially consider including in future waves of the poll. Um, so I will just leave that there for now and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Ed. I think that was a really helpful sort of start to our discussion today and just so interesting to see some of the findings that you had. And, and thanks also for breaking it down 
for our subnational governments as well. And I think, yeah, the conversation will start today and, and we have some roundtables coming up at Climate Week NYC and at COP28. So I hope to continue the discussions there, but do put your questions in the chat or send them to us after this uh, webinar. Great, I'm gonna move us along. Um, so next, um, we're gonna hear from our subnational government representatives. And we're gonna start with Barna, who's from West Bengal. Uh, Thanks for joining us, Barna. Um, so the state of West Bengal has developed a state action uh, plan on climate change. It focuses on mitigation, adaptation, and resilience. Can you tell us a bit about it? I mean, what does resilience mean to West Bengal? What are some of the initiatives that the state has taken? And how does data play a role in delivering that work? And just to give a bit of background and context to our participants, could you give us a brief overview of your state's sort of climate profile, including risks and vulnerabilities? So yeah, the floor is yours, uh, and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much, Jebi. Um, greetings to everyone from the city of Joy, Kolkata. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Marie Claire, um, Jebi, Pariyal, Rana Pujari and the entire uh, climate group uh, team for arranging this very important uh, webinar. And before I start, I express my gratitude to my departmental principal secretary, Madam Roshni Sen and Madam Neelam Meena for nominating me to speak here today. And I must also thank my colleagues uh, in my department, uh, Devlina Shairi and uh, climate fellow Abhip Shah, who's joined us from uh, climate group because they have helped me to put uh, together the thoughts that I bring to you today from the West Bengal perspective. So with these words, I would like to present my state uh, to all the participants here today. Now, West Bengal is a beautiful uh, state in Eastern India, and it spans over about 88,752 square kilometers, uh, which is roughly about 2.7% uh, of the country's geographical area and uh, our population is uh, nearly 8% of the country's population. And uh, that is spread across uh, 23 districts. So the state has a very unique mix of uh, geographical features extending from the mighty Himalayas in the north to the Bay of Bengal in the south. And in between, we have hills, forests, uh, plateaus. We have coastal and alluvial plains of the Indo-Gangetic uh, 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 coastal and alluvial zones of the Indo-Gangetic Plains, and of course, the largest delta of the world, uh, the Sundarbans. The state has a relatively unstable and um, soft coastline. And uh, if you see in the map, the coasts are kind of perpendicular to the direction of flow of the sea breeze, and that hits the uh, Bengal coastline in a transverse manner, making it a little more vulnerable. And uh, the Sundarbans, which is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, has uh, suffered a lot uh, because of uh, the destruction in the mangroves, uh, because of the extreme weather events. Um, there has been salination of the arable lands, depletion of groundwater, and uh, also a resultant uh, loss of livelihood opportunities. Now, in the recent years, uh, we find that there has been a significant uh, change uh, and shift in the seasons. Um, uh, the winters have shrunk, the uh, rainfall, onset of rainfall has changed, and uh, summers are more intense and, and, and have a longer spell. So all this together, uh, and several other factors, you know, lead to a lot of, uh, lot of adverse impacts, including health impacts because of uh, vector borne diseases. So, you know, having talked about uh, the vulnerabilities of the state, I would now like to mention some significant steps that the state is taking. So first of all, uh, West Bengal has developed one of the most robust and uh, intense, uh, intensive air quality monitoring networks in the country with almost uh, 300 uh, continuous and sensor-based monitoring stations across the uh, uh, state. And because we understand that reliable data generation forms the very crux of you know, informed decision-making policy and implementation. So uh, we have a very robust uh, network of monitoring stations. And uh, then the state has zero tolerance policy towards uh, any kind of uh, uh, waste burning, open waste burning, and we have imposed a ban on indiscriminate solid waste burning. And the state has also set up a GIS laboratory uh, where we get information about the open uh, waste burning incidents and uh, through uh, satellite imagery and 
these info these uh, incidents are immediately reported for you know for impromptu action then uh, thousands of uh, rooftop grid connected uh, solar cells and rainwater harvesting structures have been installed across the state uh, the government has very ambitious plans to uh, set up even uh, floating solar power uh, uh, plants at two dams across in the state for not only sustainable energy generation, but also for offsetting uh, carbon emissions. We have uh, about 125 square kilometers of the East Kolkata wetland area, uh, which is the world's only fully functional organic sewage management system. Uh, it receives the entire city's sewage and treats it naturally and free of cost while providing a host of ecosystem services. So it is also a, a natural uh, flood defense for the low-lying city of Kolkata. The government has recently approved an integrated management plan for the East Kolkata wetlands and currently the geotagging of the west wetlands is in progress. Now, after the severe cyclone Amphan in 2022, uh, 20, uh, May 2020, about 15 crore mangrove and other associated uh, species of saplings have been planted across the coastal districts for uh, preventing erosion, to reduce the surge heights, to reduce the flow velocity, and also for highest area rates of uh, carbon sequestration. Bengal is also... Uh, taking up a very unique bioshield project by planting uh, trees across the western border of the state for carbon sequestration and particulate uh, pollution reduction. Uh, most importantly, we are currently in the process of, uh, set, of preparing our state action plan on climate change by coordinating with various departments like the uh, power, transport, agriculture, uh, water resources department, irrigation, health, science and technology, and many other line departments of the state. Now, while doing this exercise um, uh, and while data collection and data collating and interpretation, we've come across a few challenges. I'll just quickly mention a few. First of all, I think we need a lot more uh, collaboration and more uh, coordinated approach towards streamlining climate action, focusing both on the short-term goals as well as the long-lasting impacts. Secondly, there is uh, definitely a lack of granular data at district block and panchayat levels, and we need a little more detailed uh, vulnerability assessment. And finally, um, I think there is an urgent need for capacity building amongst the departments in matters of climate financing and uh, climate budgeting. So I think uh, that would be uh, all from me at this point of time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Banla. So interesting, like knowing how vulnerable West Bengal is, but how many measures that you've had. And I think what was interesting in, in when you were talking about them is, is not only, you know, were you sort of reducing emissions, it was kind of building these resilient systems. And I, I heard some examples of nature-based solutions there as well. So yeah, lots of fascinating examples and also the kind of need for data and also more capacity building. Great. We are now going to move on to Nick. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Um, Nick, Similar to West Bengal, the city of Oakland also has an energy and climate action plan. Can you also tell us what resilience means to you and what are some of the, the um, initiatives that the government is taking um, and also how data plays a crucial role in inform informing some of your work? And again, uh, if you could just give us a bit of background and context so we understand um, about Oakland, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'll start with a quick background about Oakland. Um, Oakland, California is a vibrant and culturally diverse city uh, with a population of about 400,000 on the east side of the San Francisco Bay. Uh, our climate is typically very mild. Uh, we sit along a, a coastal plain with forested hills. Um, and we're also one of the most ethnically diverse cities in America, being a home to an African-American, Latino, Asian-American, and white population. Um, and Oakland has a very long history of environmental activism that influences our work on resilience. And that is a direct response to disproportionate impacts of pollution and climate change on our low-income and Black communities. And our city government is very focused right now on reversing the harms done by past racist housing policies and the location of pollution in the communities. Uh, we call these communities frontline communities who bear the brunt of climate change, but did the least to contribute to it. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about how we think about climate risks. 
Uh, the city has a lot of experience dealing with large scale disasters. Uh, one of the high risk issues is uh, wildfire along our wildlife, wildland urban interface. Our hillside communities, which tend to be the higher income areas, are nestled into these uh, very dry forested hills. And the catastrophic fire in the 1990s that burned over 3,000 homes is still fresh in the community's mind. And things have gotten worse in that area with rising temperatures and changes to rainfall. And the other climate, the other disaster uh, that is on our mind that is not climate related but influences our work is earthquakes. So we sit on a very large fault here in Oakland, uh, and the there's a high probability of a of a major disruption due to an earthquake that would take energy systems and water offline for weeks or months. Um, however, in in more recent years, I think we are seeing more frequent and smaller scale disruptions. And when I've asked my colleagues in the emergency department what keeps them up at night, it's these smaller items where we don't trigger a federal or state response. Uh, these kind of uh, disasters would be regional wildfire smoke. Uh, our, a lot of our communities don't have access to air filtration, excessive heat days. So our buildings are not equipped with air conditioning because of our typically nice climate and then power outages. So our utilities are shutting off uh, power distribution on wind and high heat days to not start wildfires. Um, and finally, we are seeing additional flooding in our Bayside communities. Um, and that really stretches the city's budget um, pretty thin because we're not used to seeing that kind of frequency. Um, and in terms of uh, some of our initiatives, I think the one that I'm most excited about is developing resilience hubs at city buildings. So we're looking at our city facilities that are already trusted in the community, and we're looking at how to make those a place of respite where people can uh, show up in an emergency, but also use them year round where it would build community trust, make the community stronger and more self-determined. And these would have backup power, heating, uh, heating, cooling, air filtration, um, and just ongoing programming to bring people in. And we're currently working on towards our first facility in Oakland's Chinatown. Um, and we're pursuing grants to get us uh, kind of complete on the funding there. Um, and construction should start next year on that. Um, and you know, I will I'll talk a little bit about how we're using data in our work. So we've got our equitable climate equitable climate action plan developed in 2020. Uh, we used an extensive community input process and the community was the one that added resilience hubs to that plan. Um, we were informed by a Bloomberg funded analysis that guided our emissions reduction targets. But I think the, the most important tool for my work is the racial equity impact assessment and implementation guide. Uh, so that's a data driven uh, uh, tool where it overlays a lot of data, climate risk data and equity data. So for example, whether we're deciding where to build a resilience hub or where, where to pave streets, uh, we look at maps that overlay pollution, health outcomes, poverty levels, uh, and race to work towards an equitable outcome there. Um, and just to conclude, I'll say in our small team at the city, we often find ourselves choosing between spending our time analyzing more data or implementing climate solutions. So having a well summarized data source on risk uh, really helps us be able to focus on the, the work. Um, and also our community expresses some fatigue about continual data collection. Um, so they want us to uh, you know, ask once, go do the work, and then come back with some results. Uh, so I, I think I'm at time there, uh, and I'll let you move on. Thanks so much, Nick. I can already see lots of questions coming in for you. And yeah, just so interesting to hear about, you know, the history. Um, and, and this Resilience Hub is just fascinating. And I hope next time that you join us, maybe we'll get a picture or something just so that we can start visualizing looks like but it, it sounds like a really fascinating concept that I'm sure will be sort of taken elsewhere. Great I will move us along to the next section of our discussion. So at the start Ed sort of mentioned that the Lloyd's Register Foundation uh, they fund projects linked to the World Risk Poll data. So earlier this year they announced eight new projects um, and, and it's basically putting the findings from uh, the World Risk Poll into action. And these projects, they're a mixture of secondary research and practical interventions uh, that utilize the poll data to tackle the safety issues that the, the, the data highlights. So on the panel, we have George with us, who's leading on uh, one of the World Risk Poll uh, Interaction projects. Um, the name of the project is From Perceptions to Saving Lives, Using the World Risk Poll to Design Multi-Hazard Early Warning Systems. So yeah, over to you, George. Can you tell us about this early warning systems project you've begun to lead on? Uh, thank you, Jebby. Uh, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, so uh, this this 
project, uh, uh, we were running it with uh, University College London and the International Coalition for Sustainable Infrastructure. Uh, and it seeks to close a critical gap in the, de the design of early warning systems worldwide. Background is that despite being widely acclaimed for saving lives, early warning systems are only available to about half of the world's countries. Uh, last mile communication of warnings is often quite challenging, uh, and uh, so is getting people to heed the advice given in warnings. One of the reasons behind this is that little is known about where people access information about possible disasters, uh, which organizations they go for that information, and uh, what might affect people's individual and family disaster preparedness. Uh, it, it, it is this gap in, in our knowledge that often prevents emergency managers from designing effective early warning systems. And it is this gap that this project seeks to, to address with a view to, to serving populations at uh, at risk. What we're going to do is that we're, we're going to use statistics essentially to analyze the data in the World Risk Poll and compare it across different groups, which will hopefully allow us to see patterns and trends. Uh, we'll, we'll investigate which social factors influence where people get information about possible disasters, which organizations they go for that information and what may affect individual and family disaster preparedness. Hopefully, by, by improving our early warning systems, we're going to make people around the world safer from disasters and perhaps contribute to uh, climate mitigation. Thank you. Great. Thanks, George. And just want to sort of stay with you for a moment. So based on your experience of working on climate resilience, what sort of vulnerabilities and opportunities do you see coming through the poll data and how would you go about addressing these vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So basically, the, the, the World Works poll is a massive worldwide survey about people's perception about risk, right? And, and uh, psychology and economics agree that people are fundamentally risk averse. However, risk perception does play a role in how people and communities make decisions uh, with uncertainty to reduce risk. Because the the perception of risk essentially affects people's risk behavior and therefore their actual risk level. For instance, um, uh, previous research has, has shown that the mere availability of flood insurance increases population in, in flood prone areas. In other words, uh, risk perception may encourage or discourage risk taking. Therefore, understanding how people think about the level of risk they are facing provides an insight into the range of potential behaviors. And knowing more about how people may behave helps design hazard mitigation measures and thus ultimately present opportunities to reduce the vulnerability of, of individuals, of, of households, and, and communities. Now, <laughs> excuse me. In addition, uh, hazard mitigation and disaster preparedness are fundamentally government functions, right? Therefore, the uh, the information in the World Risk Poll can help improve our understanding of people's trust in government and how this may affect their response to government, government disaster preparedness, right? For example, whether they may take protective, protective advice or not. Uh, last, this, this particular edition of the World Risk Poll offers a wealth of information about respondents' personal and family preparedness, and therefore their actual vulnerability to, to, to natural and technological disasters. Bottom line, the uh, the World Risk Poll uh, offers an insight into vulnerabilities of people stemming from their risk perception and therefore allows us opportunities to reduce those vulnerabilities by designing hazard mitigation and disaster preparedness programs. Thank you very much. Thanks, George. And I've got one final question for you. How does the poll data enable disaster risk reduction projects? I mean, what can you do with the data that you couldn't do otherwise? Right, right. Thank you. So, uh, as I said before, the, the World Risk Poll is a massive worldwide survey that, as Ed said before, covers 125,000 people in over 120 countries. It covers a broad range of issues that are related to people's perception about risk. Uh, to, my, to my knowledge, it's the only global survey that addresses the full extent of topics that we need to, answer, to, to that we need to answer the, the questions <clears throat> about risk perception and 
in the case of our project, early warning systems. Uh, previous research into early warning systems has already sought to answer uh, th these questions, but it has been either largely qualitative or focused on relatively small parts of the world, uh, for example, sub at the subnational sub -national level. Um, <clears throat> it is this unique combination of geographical and topical breadth that makes this research uh, possible. Um, and and it, it gives us the opportunity to begin with a pooled analysis across the entire sample to provide a big picture overview, and then to deep dive into the data on a country by country basis to develop a profile for each of the countries that are included in, in the World Risk Poll. Thank you. Thanks so much, George. So really good to hear about your project and, and look forward to kind of, yeah, the results as, as you kind of progress as well and, and to hear from the other projects. Great. Okay, we're going to move on um, to the closing round. Um, and Ed, I'm going to come back to you. Um, so we've we've now sort of had a really good understanding of the World Risk Poll uh, and its findings. We've heard some stories from West Bengal and Oakland. And George has just shared a really excellent example of the Early Warning Systems Project. So I guess to sum everything up, um, I, you know, I hope you can help us explain, you know, what are the benefits for states and cities of using the poll data to design targeted climate actions that save lives and uh, help people feel safer? Yeah, thanks, Jerby. So I can do that by coming back to a couple of points I made earlier, but with reference to a couple of examples that have come up in, in the other speakers' um, at points there, which provide really good examples. So fundamentally, a top level uh, about enabling this much broader holistic assessment of resilience, considering the societal factors, considering the hard infrastructure factors, but also, you know, considering these things about individual sense of agency and about kind of community um, support and where are the kind of the, the social and psychological factors that come into building resilience. So this um, point about um, the, the, the early warning systems and how you actually ensure that those are effective in getting people to evacuate, to take action. On the one hand, there's the, the infrastructure side about of making sure you have the communication system in place to do that, to make sure you can practically send and have people receive those messages. But whether people actually, um, that last mile communication, where they actually um, see that and respond that and kind of trust those sources of information, um, that's a whole other factor. And you need both of those things to come together to create a successful sort of disaster response so the kind of data that we have in the poll to speak to that is really useful where we ask people about what are their most trusted sources of information when it comes to um, warnings and, and hazards and disasters um, and, and questions about how much trust and faith they have in different kind of government institutions those are kind of really important to helping understand whether those messages are going to land um, and also to kind of reiterate the point about how that enables us to identify kind of vulnerabilities and what are the kind of specific things that may be undermining kind of resilience and then thinking about the, the community support and resilience side of things and on that note that's why I was really excited to hear Nick what was saying about these kind of resilience hubs which really seemed to me to be a fantastic opportunity to both harness those existing kind of community networks for community support but also to kind of build and enhance that to, to improve resilience um, overall. Great thank you. And then could you tell us a bit about how the poll data works? Uh, what needs to be in place for states or cities to use it well? When does it work best? And what doesn't the poll data help with? Mm -hmm. Well, on the uh, the link I shared in the, the chat, so on the lrfworldriskpoll.com website, all of this data is freely and publicly available. There are a number of visual um, data explorer tools that people can use to explore all of this data around resilience. And that's something that anybody really could, can use to see that data at a national level. Now, the full data set is also there to, to download, but to make kind of use of that fully, really, there needs to be some kind of um, in-house kind of data analytical capability, um, because really kind of the, the data set works best when we combine it with wider sources of data to see what other factors may be at play. So we can kind of combine it with wider data um, from, from the Gallup World Poll. We can um, combine it with, you know, contextual um, data around other kind of socioeconomic kind of factors. But that is something that, that the team here at LRF are here to, to help with. And we can kind of support and talk to governments if there's some kind of data they've seen in the poll, but they're interested in how maybe that those kind of question responses vary with some other factors. It's potentially um, something we can help with. So, so do 
absolutely kind of talk to us about those opportunities. Um, it's also something that's really helpful when we're talking about kind of informing um, and kind of providing a framework for more locally kind of specific and uh, focused assessments of resilience. So, um, for example, in one of our other funded projects in the WRP Interaction um, a set of eight projects you mentioned earlier, one of our grant holders is using the way we assess resilience um, within the World Risk Poll to refine and to expand a, a disaster risk assessment um, scorecard that they're deploying in a number of cities in Africa. So it's really helping to provide that framework and grounding data. Great, thanks. And that's so good that you're sort of there to support. And I am, you can see that in the projects that you're supporting as well. So I guess on that note, I have a final question for you. What is your one piece of advice for Bunna and Nick? You know, we've heard from West Bengal and Oakland. What is your one piece of advice to them? I think, um, again, it's really about being open minded. I think in, in terms of how we conceive of resilience and really making sure that all of these different kind of factors, the, the social and the personal and the economic that affect resilience are being considered, um, as, as well as the um, infrastructure measures, because that's what really kind of helps us to see where particular groups and demographics may be kind of left behind and where maybe we're not constructing really kind of equitable um, resilience. Um, and, and on that kind of note, for example, uh, again, I was great to hear kind of the emphasis on sort of racial equity in um, Oakland's work on, on resilience. And there really is great data within the poll that um, speaks to that in terms of people's experience of discrimination, how that relates um, to a number of other resilience measures. So it's something that could potentially be sort of very useful to, to governments who, who'd like to do that kind of racial equity assessment around their resilience um, interventions. Great. Thank you so much, Ed. So that kind of brings us to the end of our sort of round of questions, but now we'll open up the floor uh, to the participants to ask questions. And I know that I can sort of see lots of questions coming in through the chat um, and my colleagues have sent me some um, that they've highlighted. So my first question, this is actually a question that might be uh, helpful for Nick or Barna or both of you to answer. What is the role of community and social connections in building resilience at a societal level? Are public spaces a contributing factor to that and how can states and regions help create campaigns that help build social resilience so i don't know who wants to i don't know maybe um, nick since we, I, we started talking about the resilience oh go ahead then Vana, and then i'll come to nick okay thank you jabi um uh, when it comes to uh, awareness and taking the community along, I think uh, some of the things that I must mention from my state is that we run, a, in our state, we run a National Green Corps program, which uh, involves students and teachers of about uh, roughly about 5,800 schools and about 100 colleges. And uh, this activity, uh, you know, prepares and grooms the young generation about various environmental issues and threats. And uh, I think this is a very, very important step uh, towards uh, resilience building uh, because it, it prepares the uh, future generation. And uh, secondly, another very important thing that we have uh, done in the recent times is uh, uh, about thousands of uh, green cook stoves, uh, the cook stoves which have uh, almost zero carbon footprint were provided to thousands of uh, rural households in Bengal and uh, the gas-based irons uh, were uh, distributed to, you know, to the very marginal people who work on the uh, lanes and uh, they do ironing on the roads, you know, and they used to use uh, coal burning uh, irons. So thousands of uh, gas-based irons and less polluting LPG ovens have been distributed by the government to the, uh, uh, to these roadside beneficiaries, you know, for the ironwalas and uh, also for the roadside eateries where uh, a lot of smoke used to be there. So we have seen a very, very significant change uh, after this has been done. So I think this must be brought to the notice because uh, this is what, you know, involving community means. And another thing is um, with the help of the community, we have uh, created a biodiversity register in the state. And uh, this is a very unique initiative. And we have declared about 10 biodiversity heritage sites for species conservation. We have also developed seed banks for conservation of traditional as well as salinity resistant rice varieties. 
Um, and uh, we have set up conservation sanctuaries for a number of uh, uh, items like medicinal plants for butterflies, for indigenous uh, freshwater fishes, you know, so all this together, I think, uh, goes a long way in uh, in involving social connections and community involvement and taking the people along. So that's my take. Thanks so much, Thank Panna. Nick. And I can give you a comment based on our work on resilience hubs. So I think uh, looking for places that are already trusted by the community and used frequently is the top of mind for us. And the example that I told you about uh, that we're developing in Chinatown, that is a loved and well-used facility already that is in need of a lot of upgrades. Uh, their their programming is 100% booked usually uh, with, with day camps for children and elderly programs. So we're, we're targeting all of our work on places where people are already going. A frequent uh, partner there is the library, and we're finding that they were already doing resilience work uh, before this was a term. They, during the COVID uh, pandemic, they've been handing out meals, providing repair, uh, phone charging, things like that. And I would say the aim is to come in to those communities and give a space for additional community building. I think there's already that work happening. We want to support what's already been going on uh, and, and not reinvent the wheel. And a lot of this is happening in the community at houses of worship or in uh, even a cafe in Oakland. So we're seeing this all this work happening in the community and the role of the city is how do we help that move along without um, you know, redoing the work. Thanks, Nick. That's really great. I'm just going to stay with you, Nick. There's another question here about how does Oakland collaborate with or work with the state of California? And where do you see opportunities for states and cities to work together to build greater resilience? We rely quite a bit on the state of California uh, for funding. So they, they are starting to release quite a bit of funding through grants aimed at uh, community resilience. And uh, we are going for them. Uh, a lot of work to, to follow the grants and uh, collect community partners to apply with us. Uh, but that is in, in a city like Oakland with a uh, limited budget that is very critical. And we're looking to the state for uh, funding and guidance on, on what should be in, in resilience hubs. Uh, and then regionally, we have a good, good relationship with our uh, county and neighboring cities where we are all part of a community energy um, aggregator where we we buy clean energy together and work on uh, energy resilience programs together. So the cities of Berkeley, Hayward, San Francisco are our neighbors. Um, and we, we share knowledge with them quite a bit. Great, excellent, yeah. Okay, Banna, I have another question for you. Um, you talked about uh, the wetland areas in West Bengal, um, which sounded like a very promising nature-based solution. Um, what um, the participant would like to know is how this is managed and operated at a large scale. So it's, yeah, taking these great ideas to scale. Are you still there, Banna? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So um, so as I told you, uh, the East Kolkata wetland is, uh, is, is an uh, organic sewage management uh, system on its own. And uh, it uh, receives the city's entire city's sewage and uh, then treats it naturally. And uh, the, the flora and fauna in the wetland benefit from that. And in turn, they treat uh, this entire treatment is a very natural process, and there is no expenditure of, of money or uh, any excess, uh, you know, power or energy for this. So this is a completely natural system, and uh, it also provides a host of ecosystem because there are a lot of fishes surviving, a lot of vegetables growing, and uh, it, it is a very beneficial system. At the same time, it also acts as a, you know, a, a defense for for flooding. Um, of the uh, low-lying city of Kolkata, and it really uh, needs to be, uh, you know, protected and conserved. And we, I mean, it's a blessing for us that we have a, a wetland uh, of that nature and that uh, area uh, in our state, um, which uh, which would have otherwise cost us, uh, you know, to treat the entire city's sewage would have really cost us uh, a bomb, and. Um, uh, the government uh, has been very keen on uh, preservation of this, and so we are now going ahead with the integrated uh, management plan for the East Kolkata wetlands. 
and uh, we are doing a geo tagging of the all the listed uh, wetlands the uh, which have been identified in in this area and uh, this is going to be a, a very good job as well as a very challenging job so, thanks banna that's great i've got a question here for ed and george if you also have anything to add please do um so do any uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation projects consider support for application of the poll at a specifically subnational level for integration into local resilience planning and action? Uh, yes, absolutely. 100% is the answer to that. So actually, I will share another link in the chat shortly, which will provide um, links to some information on um, all of the projects we're funding at the moment connection with this. But on that note, there's one in particular I can um, think of um, being run by ICLE Africa, um, where the World Risk Poll data is being used to assess and then de develop sort of specific uh, resilience solution packages um, for free um, target cities in Africa, which are being identified as part of that project. So yes, it's absolutely everything, uh, absolutely something that we're doing, and we'd be kind of keen to, to look at more projects of that nature. Great. And George, did you have anything to add to that at all? Uh, uh, not, not really. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks, Ed. Uh, the, uh, I mean, our project is specific, specifically uh, specifically focuses at, at the country level because we wanted a global coverage, but there is nothing precluding uh, precluding us from from uh, looking into a specific region if there is interest uh, uh, and and uh, uh, please uh, uh, get in touch with me or Ed so that we can uh, we can look uh, look into it. Right. Thanks, George. And yeah, final question I think for you, Ed. Um, it's it's around the data and whether a platform exists where you can have all the data gathered together and report on subnational resilience, something similar, I guess, to, to CDP, the Carbon Disclosure Project. Oh, and I suppose you mean there that would be something where we were um, merging our data with other sources of kind of resilience data. Um, not that I'm aware of off the top of my head, but if if people have thoughts or, or know something, I would love to know about it. Please do let me know because we would love to be able to contribute our resilience data to a platform of that nature to help it be um, you know used and accessed more. And as I said earlier, the, this data is most powerful when it's combined and cross analyzed with with other forms of resilience data. Great, thank you. So I think those were all the questions that we've received. Um, Great. I don't know if there's any more in the chat. But I think, yeah, this has been a really rich discussion. And as I said, it's just been the start. Uh, we will continue this at Climate Week uh, New York and also at COP28. So, yeah, thank you for all the questions that you've put into the chat. Um, first of all, thank you to all our guest speakers today and for all the participants for joining us um, in this important discussion. I think there's probably a lot that's been captured in the discussion and in the chat. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll follow up with an email and we'll answer any uh, you know, questions that weren't answered today in, in that email. Um, before we sign off today, there's actually a feedback survey as, as we end the call. So please do provide us with feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and know how we can improve this series and yeah, what else we need to consider. And, and you know, Ed's just kind of mentioned these new ideas. We'd, we'd love to hear about them so we can think about sort of how we take this uh, work further. Uh, but yeah, I guess before we end, it would be great if everybody could turn on their video, if that's possible, um, so that we can take a group uh, photograph. Um, and, and that just leaves us to say goodbye once we've done that. Alrighty, I'll wait about three more seconds while everyone is turning their cameras on. Perfect, thank you. Great, I think we've almost got a full house. Almost. Okay, fabulous. All right, everyone smile in three, two, one. Thank you and goodbye. And if you just unmute and say goodbye, goodbye everyone. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, goodbye. everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.